you know, I really feel like the universe just doesn't want me to have a class today. It really doesn't. Because I tried filming earlier today, and then my roommates decided to be all loud in the living room, and I could basically hear them sit like as if they were sitting right next to me. And so I decided to wait on filming to later times, that way I wouldn't have to shout over them and we wouldn't have to have them disturbed in our class. And then now I'm, you know, halfway through filming and the sun is leaving me. It's like the universe is telling me, not today, it is not your day to film a class. But you know what universe? We're going for it anyway. <laughs> we are gonna make it through and we're gonna have some discussions about Mercy Thompson. If it's the last thing I do. Okay, it's a little bit extreme, but let's just move on and get going. <laughs> Welcome back, fantasy fiction fanatics. It's great to see you again, and I hope you're doing well. Today we are going to be starting our next book in the Mercy, Tr Mercy Thompson series, uh, Bloodbound, the first four chapters. I hope you are enjoying it already. Um, let me know what you think of the Mercy Thompson series in general, if you have or haven't read it before. Uh, if you haven't read it, how are you enjoying your first read? If you've read it before and are reading it again, please let me know how you are liking it, uh, rereading it again. Uh, I've said this before, but this is one of my favorite series, so I always enjoy reading it again. And always just get so much joy out of it. Alright, so... As always, we will go ahead and start with our recap. So in this set of chapters, we have the very, very beginning where Mercy gets a tall call from Stefan, and the call is for her to repay back the favor that she owes him based on the last book where he helped her get uh, in touch with Marcella and helping her find out the information about where uh, Jesse was being kept. So he, she gets the call, she agrees to help him out by talking to a vampire who's in the area that's not supposed to be, or at least hasn't paid the correct, uh, gone through the correct channels in order to be in Marcella's territory, and she's meant to go with as a coyote in order just to help him uh, intimidate the vampire in question. And she goes, and they find that really it's a sorcerer who has been turned into a vampire that is uh, at the hotel and that he has killed everybody and has a woman in his bathroom who he then drags out and makes uh step well he drinks the blood from her and makes Stefan believe that he killed her uh, uh after mercy is knocked out from the encounter the, she wakes up and she's home with Stefan and sam and they debate over what actually happened versus what Stefan thought happened and they find out that his memories have been changed while hers have not been and she agrees to help him out with um, a trial at the seethe uh, when that becomes necessary in order to save him from being accused of killing her himself. Uh, while he is dead in her closet she does escape for a while and goes to her mechanic shop where she helps out for the day despite being bruised and blackened from the encounter and has a run-in with a reporter who is trying to get dirt on at her and adam then we have warren and ben who show up to be her escorts for the meeting with the vampires which they make it to and she ends up witnessing Stefan's truth, or the, his talking of, for the uh, meeting, and then she ends up in the chair and stating her truths to the seethe, which ends up saving Stefan, at least for the time being, because now he has what she believes to be about a month or so, or seven weeks. I think, she, I think it was she thought that the term they used meant a week, so maybe seven weeks? Or a month. I can't remember which. Please let me know down below, because apparently I can't remember even though we just read it. Um, but anyway, it gives him some time in order to figure out where the sorcerer is and to provide proof that there is a sorcerer or a vampire in the midst of the area in order to clear his name from killing the woman and the others at the hotel. So some pretty interesting things happen. We are once again at the start of a book. 
uh, not in the middle of the book. So as always, I'd like to discuss how our author starts the story and how we have transitioned from one book to the next book. We talked in our last episode, our last class, that we couldn't really do the same thing that we did with Dragonlance, where we transitioned from the first book to the second book and the second book to the third book, because this series is different in the fact that the first book had its own plot, its own problem, its own um, conflict that is resolved by itself in the space of that one book. So there wasn't really a way to predict what was going to be in this book because we were going to be starting a whole different story. Uh, Obviously we figured we would still have the main character and most of the other characters that we've seen transition from one book to the next book, but we weren't sure what the plot line would be, what kind of uh, conflicts would be occurring because with having the one plot completely finished, uh, the author had a complete brand new set of problems that she could create and she could do basically anything she wanted with this new book. So we didn't really have any way of transitioning over from one to the other other than seeing how she finished the book and us now seeing how she starts this book. Um, So let's go ahead and get started on kind of analyzing a little bit about the differences between starting book one and starting book two. Book two, uh, as we've noticed already, is a lot quicker to getting to the plot and getting to the problem that's happening in Mercy's life right now. We don't have as much of a leeway between starting the story and getting to what the problem is. And not only that, but getting from what the problem is, like in the last one, Jesse's kidnapped, to actually getting into the more intense moments of that conflict which happens later when Adam is also uh, kidnapped and the whole thing with Marcella at that point and stuff like that. So we have some time between figuring out what's the problem and actually getting into some of the more intense moments in the book. A lot of that has to come with us setting up our story. The author had to first introduce characters before we could have a problem with those characters. We first had to explain the world before we could know what kinds of things were possible. In this story, because we already have book one to kind of set us up, even though we're not necessarily experts on this world yet, there's still lots that we don't know, we have enough knowledge about characters and the basic concept of the world that we jump right in to our problem in this story. Stefan calls her up and the second that they go to that hotel, we're already in the midst of a more intense moment, a moment where uh, Mercy is in danger, where Stefan is not able to protect her like he thought he could, where you're wondering, how is she going to get out of this? You're already wondering, how is she going to get out of this encounter? And once again, in uh, chapter four, we have another intense encounter with the vampires, where we're wondering, how is Mercy going to get out of this? Especially now that they all know that she's a walker, and even though she had the two werewolves with her, it's not necessarily a guarantee that she would make it out safely and that they wouldn't Um, go against what they have promised. We don't know enough about the vampires and what their promises mean. Um, We are also expected, uh, in the same kind of general concept, to know who these characters are. We already have had the prep from book one, and uh, Patricia Briggs in book two now has given us small reminders of who people are. For example, Sam and him living there for a while. We get a little bit of a reminder about who Adam is, where he lives. Um, a little bit of a reminder about who Ben is and Warren is, that kind of stuff. But for the most part, Patricia expects that you have read book one, so now in book two, she doesn't need to do all of the setup work all over again. We already know Adam, and we already know Sam, and we already know Warren, and Ben, and Z, and so on and so forth. So we don't need to have the same um, explanation about them. We don't have to have the same setup. We've already seen them through some troubled times and we already know what they have done through that troubled time and so we already have a basic character built and presented in order to be, we assume, to be the same basic person in this book. So she doesn't have to play it out and be the slow start that we had at the last book because we already have that basic setup, not only of the world but also of the character she's placing in this world. 
Um, we also have less time between events, which also comes from the fact that she doesn't need to explain everything all over again. It all kind of ties together, is that because we have this basic uh, knowledge from beforehand, from the previous book, she can get to the point of the problem, she can get uh, to the characters much quicker, and she can get to um, the different events much quicker. We don't have the lingered time where Mercy's explaining stuff to us, or where um, we have character building moments, if that makes sense. For example, the chatting between Sam and Mercy when she goes up to um, Montana. <laughs> like, where am I thinking of? Uh, when she goes up to Montana and talks to Bran and stuff like that, and they have the moment between her and Bran talking, between her and Sam talking. Uh, they've got the moments where she's um, talking to herself or thinking to herself about how all the women don't like her up there. Or when we're back down with Warren, they have those moments where um, she's introducing things and introducing people. So because we don't need all of that uh, character building moments, all those slow moments, we can jump right into the events. One, two, three, you know, we can go do the stuff with, with Stefan, come back. We do have that moment where we're sharing information and then she's instantly at our where uh, her her uh, shop. And yes, you might think that the shop is a little bit more of a slower moment, but we don't have this drag out of like, you know, who these characters are, nothing like that. We get right to the event of her being at her shop and we get right to the event of the reporter harassing her. And then we get right to the point of going right to the, the sea right afterwards. So we don't have all this slow build up time in between like we did with for the fact that uh, Adam's house got broken into in the first one and Jesse was kidnapped and then she has to spend all this time driving up to Montana and that's where we slow down we have them him up there and then we come back and there's time down with figuring out who the pack is and who can be trusted and then you start getting into the the moments where like hey this is something important happening with the vampires this is us progressing forward oh and then we have the downtime of discussing discussing okay and now Adam is taken like you know what I'm trying to say those little down moments those slow progressions between each important really important event we get to the events much quicker much uh, heavier stuff much faster and that all again ties into the fact that we don't have to do the same kind of setup as we did for book one for in order for the reader us as readers to be able to understand what's happening so it was essential for the first book, but this one, it's not so important because we already have that background information. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, we are starting off a brand new plot, a brand new problem. So of course, everything's gonna be a fresh boot on that versus Dragonlance where we already knew what our conflict was and we just had to figure out what place in time we were at because there was a little bit of gap between book one and book two of where they're at and we just had to continue and see what they were going to do progressing forward. Here, though we do find out what the plot is going to be very, uh, or the conflict is very quickly, we had to start all over from brand new things. So we do start with the uh, kind of the down moment where, you know, she's in bed and she is then getting the call from Stefan. So we do, like I said, go into it quicker, but we do have to start at the point where we're at a starting point. The starting point is Stefan's call. And that's what is going to move us forward to finding out what the new plot is. Did that make sense? I hope so. All right. Um, I did want to kind of mention, like we had uh, with Dragonlands, we were talking about titles and how we kind of thought they kind of foreshadowed a little bit. It was easier to see what the foreshadowing was in the fact that uh, they did follow the seasons and we did know what the main plot was from book one and it was continuing through all three. So we can make our judgment of what we thought the titles related to. For this, we don't really have a large plot progression in order to follow with the titles, but as you can tell, uh, as we continue going forward, possibly we'll see if that this guess is true or not. But from the first two titles that we have, now that we know a little bit about each book, well, we know all about book one, but we already know a little bit about book two, we can kind of see a pattern, at least I can at this point. Maybe you have a different theory or not, and you're welcome to comment down below. 
Um, but I see the correlation with Bloodbound being related to vampires, since it seems like the beginning of our plot and our beginning of our conflict is going to be about vampires. I can see how Bloodbound has been made the title. We don't know what the bound part is. Uh, it does sound very uh, concerning, and the fact of that being bl uh, bound to the blood can either mean vampires themselves are bound to blood, or it might be something that deals with mercy. We don't know at this point. Moon called at the beginning could be very related to the fact that it's about werewolves. And the fact that they are called every full moon to transform into a werewolf on the, the full moon. So we can already see a little bit of a pattern that maybe we can help us in the future be able to make guesses on what our books are about. But it's going to be very interesting to see exactly what Bloodbound means for this book and this plot. Uh, as the same in Dragonlance, we do have a, an estimate of a little bit of, of time being passed between book one and book two. We do have her talking about, you know, her dates with Adam and how that has progressed a little bit, how Sam hasn't moved out and how he's progressed a little bit. So we do know that some time has passed. Doesn't say specifically how much time has passed, but we do know they aren't quite the same point as when we left them. So we do have that same little bit of time gap like we did for Dragon Lance. And we'll see if that ends up changing things or if it doesn't really affect the story much at all. We'll have to find out. And last but not least, I feel like it's important to talk about for this start. We have a lot fewer characters that we are focusing on at the beginning of this book. We'll see if that ends up being the case continually or if it's just because the, this plot point doesn't require as many characters at the beginning. But at the beginning of the first book, because we were introducing the world and introducing the characters, we had a lot of people introduced to us in a short amount of time. We obviously had to meet our main character, Mercy, but we met um, the police uh, person that's with her. That We met the mother of... Why is it that like, I know names and then the second I try and do this class, like all the names go out of my mind. But her new helper <laughs> at her garage, we know... Uh, him, uh, his mom. We know we knew about Mac. We knew about Adam. We knew about Eliza Betta. We knew um, about Daryl and we saw Ben and then only a couple chapters in really we talked about Bran and Sam when she went up to uh, the werewolves in Montana and so we get a lot of characters. We knew Jesse right off the gate. You know a lot of these characters are brought up very quickly and are inserted into Mercy's life. Obviously, naturally she interacted with all those people and that was necessary, but book one, we really had a large amount of people shoved into a short amount of chapters right at the very beginning. Here, we don't have that many characters. We've got Stefan, Adam, Mercy, obviously. I don't really count her since that is the main point of view, but Mercy and Sam. Did I mention that? No. Okay, we're good. <laughs> um, so we basically have four characters, at least part of main characters that we are interacting with. We have four that actually make an appearance in these chapters. Well, I guess if you count Warren and Ben there at the end with the him, uh, with them helping her at the the, where, uh, the vampire seed, then it would be six. But that is a lot smaller focus. We've got a lot more focus on exact events. We do see a little bit of Z and a little bit of her uh, new help, but we don't really spend much time on them. Not like we did with Bran and Sam really talking about her background information with them, talking about background with Adam, talking about background of Elizabeth's role as a witch. Like, I mean, we do still see the characters, obviously we've seen Marcella and all the vampires, but they're not actually something that's been focused on. We do have very few characters that we actually have real focus on at the beginning. Um, people that we would consider main reoccurring characters that are important to Mercy. We have a much smaller amount starting off and we don't have to build them up since we already have previous knowledge of them. We don't have to do as much digging. We can now just focus on who they are and progressing with the story and how they are helping Mercy with the problems she's already encountering. 
All right, now let's go ahead and talk about some vampires. Since we have had quite a lot of interaction with the vampires this uh, early in the book. Sorry, I'm losing my lighting. <laughs> the sun is going down, so please forgive me for as it slowly gets darker and darker. Hopefully we won't be filming in the dark, but you never know. All right, so I just made a, like, a list of different things that we have learned about vampires at the beginning of this book. Um, vampires and this section is really important because we are doing more world building and so we are being able to understand even more and more as we continue through this series things that will be important obviously important events important uh, creatures and beings that Mercy interacts with so Patricia is building this world and making it even more complex and more uh, giving us more surprises more things to deal with more more and more just just more oh, sorry about that let me um so let's go ahead and look at this list we now learn that in this world mercy's world that the vampires don't sleep during the day they die during the day they literally are dead corpses until the night revives them again I think that's very, very interesting take on vampires. I don't think I've ever read any other vampire stories that have that. Uh, go ahead and leave in the comments down below if you know of any other stories that have it where they actually are physically dead during the day. Uh, they are very territorial. Marcilla especially is very territorial of her area, not only uh, vampire-wise, but any other paranormal creature-wise. Uh, it's very... Uh, Kind of, I think we've mentioned in the first book how you have to pay her in order for any paranormals to be in her territory. Obviously, Adam and the uh, werewolves that already live there are different because that's their permanent residence, but anybody passing through does have to talk to the seeds before they can spend time in the area. They are seen as evil by all other paranormals. We've had this mentioned a couple of times, especially by Mercy, that vampires are seen to be evil. It doesn't matter when you returned, what happened for your turning, why you turned, what kind of person you are, vampires equal evil. Um, we will continue to see as we progress with them, whether that actually is the truth or not, or if it's perception, if it's not perception. Uh, I'm not really sure what has, we haven't really heard of like what deems them as evil or what makes it so that way they are automatically evil if you become a vampire. We're not really sure at this point, but werewolves, Mercy, Z, they all establish, uh, which Z is a fae, just all establish that vampires should not be interacted with because they are evil. We'll see what happens with that. Um, constant mention of them needing to pretend to be human. So, especially when it comes to Stefan, she mentions how it doesn't really seem like he's pretending to be human. He has much more human behaviors, except for occasionally where he's like most of the other vampires where it looks like they're just pretending to be human. They have the human portions of their behavior down, but at the same time, it's something that's not quite right about it. And so it seems like they're pretending to be human and that you can tell that there's something off about them. Um, they're obviously blood-oriented creatures, which goes back to what we were uh, talking about with the title. And of course, that makes sense. Vampires are always known to be uh, creatures that suck blood from humans or possibly animals or possibly both, depending on the storyline. Um, but their, their existence and their life does depend around being able to drink blood and have blood into their system consistently. Uh, a lot of times they kill. Sometimes the way that the blood works is different. Uh, sometimes when you're older, you don't need as much. Sometimes that's not the case. It really depends on the storyline, but obviously they're a blood-oriented type of being. Um, they use blood magic when they use magic. So we have the uh, chair that she sits in that has the spikes and it uses that blood in order to sense the truth for whether you're actually telling the truth or not. So obviously their magic is also, they base it around blood just as much as their normal being is oriented around blood and the intake of blood. 
we don't know too much more about magic and uh, what they, how they use it in their society or what other magics they have, but the one that we have been introduced to does also revolve around blood to make it work. Um, stillness seems to mean something in their society. We don't really know what that is yet, but as they were waiting for Stefan to be brought in, everyone is still, still as a statue. Uh, no one was either been breathing or blinking or anything. Obviously, it freaked Mercy out, uh, which is understandable. Sorry, my like light is really going now, and it's almost blinding me in the face on occasional glimpses I get of it. Okay, um, so we don't actually know what that stillness means in their society, but we do know that it means something, and we know that it's important for whatever it means. <laughs> um, but stillness is obviously something that is part of their society. Hopefully as we continue going, we will figure out exactly what that means and what what that means in their society. Maybe that's kind of part of like the werewolves where they have their dominance uh, fights against each other or whatever you would say that is, their dominance um, face-offs. Maybe the stillness is something to do with that. I'm not sure. We'll have to find out and see if we see anything about that. But it obviously means something. Um, it's hard to understand their body language and dominance moves. So it's Mercy's constantly guessing like, oh, I don't know what this means and I don't know what this gesture means and I don't know how, you know, like staring into the vampire's eyes can obviously bewitch you, but she doesn't, under doesn't know if like between two vampires, if staring into each other's eyes as dominance just like it is for werewolves. We don't really know much about that and it's clear to us that we don't know much about their dominance and their hierarchy for uh, their society is based off of. So that'll be something that we will continue to learn but it is something that has been brought up and we have especially been es explicitly been told that we don't understand this portion yet. Um, they have to be careful about who they turn. We kind of mentioned this a little bit in the last book, but they do have to be careful about who they turn because any mental problems or any physical problems or any uh, magic or any anything that's happening to them when they're human will transfer that to them when they turn. It will not go away. So they do have to be very, very careful on who they turn because they don't want to turn somebody who would then expose them to the public and possibly put them in danger so it's very very important for them to be careful about who they turn versus a werewolf who yes can be made um, it doesn't really change the attributes of them as a person um, but it looks like the same thing is with vampires except vampires tr uh, it somehow transfers over to becoming amplified at least that's how it seems uh, to be in this case. Did that make sense? I felt like my path in my brain did not follow quite what I was saying out loud. So please let me know if I need to clarify on that point down below. I'd be happy to go over it again. Um, and then we obviously found out this out in the last one, but walkers are immune to their magic. We see that there's some immunity in the fact of being interacting with a vampire that's also a sorcerer, though the sorcerer did also didn't know who she was at the time. I just thought she was a coyote. So we don't know if he actually deliberately tried to change her memories, if that would happen or not. We don't know. But at this point, walkers and general vampire abilities don't, uh, don't work on her and don't work on walkers in general. That's why they killed them off. And then we've had the mention of the term sheep, which Mercy is sure does not really mean the animal sheep. So we will see if that's a term that we come up with again and if we learn more about it. I'm sure you can make a guess on what you think sheep means, just as I can make a guess on what sheep means, though I've also read it and I do know what sheep means, so I'm not going to say anything at this point. We'll just have to see as we continue when we find out exactly what the term sheep means in terms of vampires. Um, anything you want to mention that I've missed, anything you want to talk about more in depth, if there's anything I didn't clarify, please mention it down below. As always, would love to have a discussion with you or to hear any of your concerns or questions about what I've talked about um, for vampires. And uh, 
yeah, I think that we covered quite a bit, especially how um, uh, most of it is actually brought up in the beginning of this book, not necessarily everything being brought up in the last one. We do get lots of new information and we do get more interactions with vampires that aren't just Stefan and Marcilla. So they have that whole crowd uh, going on and we see the, the interaction with the sorcerer vampire. So it's pretty interesting, I think, uh, especially some of the unique qualities of the vampires in this story, I feel like, uh, do make them a very, very interesting uh, being compared to other vampire stories. Really interesting nuances. Now, of course, since we are starting this book, uh, brand new book of Mercy Thompson, we of course have to talk, I feel like in my opinion, about Mercy. Because it's a first person point of view and Mercy is our first person. So, as I mentioned when we started our last one, if we don't like the main character, we're not going to read it. First person is very essential to liking the main character, because if you don't like the main character and you have to spend all your time, not only with the main character, but in their brain, you're not going to like the, the series. You're not going to like reading it. You're not going to want to care about what's happening. It just won't do it for you. So I feel like you have to like your main character when it's a first person point of view. And so of course, since we spend the most time with this character and we're actually from their point of view, that you kind of have to have a discussion <laughs> about who this person is that we are following around and uh, hearing all of their crazy adventures. So we did talk about Mercy and we felt like, or at least I felt like, uh, that we hadn't had too much development for her. We just more was setting a basis of who she is uh, for the most part. Then of course we have the beginning of this book with brand new problems and we're going to see a brand new light of her with new progressions going on in her life of course we either see her change or we see new perceptions of her that then give us a changed perception to us as a reader um, obviously some things are going to be the same because she is still the basic person that she always is um, but now we're seeing more sides to her and more different things that she's going to be interacting with and we'll have to see as we continue through this book if she does end up changing by the end of the book. We'll have to see. Um, so I want to go ahead and talk about some of the traits that she has now that we've seen, some of the ones that we've seen before that we continue to see or continue to show us that this is a consistency for her and some things that we are introduced to now that uh, we're starting this next session of her life. So to start off with, of course, this is going to be, I, this is what I believe personally is the very core of her and foundation of her being, of her personality, of her soul, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think even though this is only the second book, we can already tell that this is who she is as well as we've had many other characters say this is who she is. So it's a pretty good staple bet to say that this is already known that, that this is a staple for her. And that is she is a very independent woman. She's very independent and she's very determined woman, I should say. Um, she doesn't like being helped. She doesn't like needing help. Not saying that she never asks for help. Like for example, you know, Z helping out with her garage. She does not hate that Z helps her out with her garage. But she also is not the person to think, hey, let me call up Z and have him cover my garage, except for in extreme situations. She did think about it last, the last uh, book, because she actually physically could not go into the garage and do her job. But at the beginning here, we see that Stefan, not Stefan, <laughs> Sam is the one that calls Z and says, hey, can you help out because Mercy's hurt and expects her to stay home. She was thinking she was going to have to go into her garage because she didn't even think to call Z. She could go in, even though she really shouldn't go in, but she could physically get up and actually make it to there and do basic work. So she didn't think, hey, maybe I should call Z and take the day off because she is a very independent woman who believes that and I think also partly it's because of her experiences that she's had to do a lot of things on her own is that she just naturally tends to be hey I gotta get my own things done I'm not gonna rely on anybody else so she's very independent and she's very determined we see this in the fact that she not that I want to say that she burns bridges but she basically denies 
the help that is readily given to her most of the time. Not only does she deny it, she's also headstrong in the fact that she will go ahead and do the stupid thing or the thing that's unsafe uh, and agree to doing unsafe things because she wants to get something done. For example, she doesn't let Sam talk her out of helping Stefan out and going and doing the meeting with the seas, um, even though it's really dangerous and she could die <laughs> and they could all kill her. Um, because she wants to help Stefan. So she's very determined, and very hard headed, very not going to be persuaded away from what she believes is right, which has its good points and has its bad points, just as any trait does. I mean, not everything is always just good. She is determined to help out the people who she cares about and to do the right thing, which is really a good thing for somebody to be. But at the same time, when it's really dangerous and you're questioning their sanity uh, because they might not make it out alive, sometimes that's not always a good thing to be quite so determined. Um, it just has its own pros and cons. So we definitely see that independent and determined are two of her very core traits. We saw them in the last book with her doing kind of her own thing and just going her own way and not caring about the risks as much as she probably should. And we see that here even at the beginning with her going as a coyote and taking the harness that she knows is not going to be proactive for her as well as going and doing the meeting with the seeds to save Stefan, even though in many other characters' eyes, Stefan is not worth caring about or saving because he is deemed as evil. Which even she says that she, technically he should be evil, but she just can't classify him as such. So, we've got those two main traits down, and we see them once again right off the bat. Uh, we see that she's very... Uh, finds her debts important. She follows through on them. We see them at the very beginning here where she doesn't, she knows she's doing something unsafe and she doesn't really know if she wants to be helping out Stefan, but she follows through on helping him because she had that debt to him and she promised him to a blank check, pretty much a, a favor in order to get the information she needed before. So she just steps up right there and uh, really values her word and saying that she was gonna do this. So she ends up doing it. So again, that kind of goes a little hand in hand with her being independent and determined, um, but it's just another facet of it, just something else that she really cares about her word, cares about her honor to the people that she cares about, and is going to follow through with, if she says that she's going to do something, then she's going to do it. Oh, sorry guys, I gotta adjust here. All right. All right, all right, all right. Next one is something that's new. Something that maybe we could have guessed at, possibly. Uh, but we see now some of her weaker spots in the fact that she is very scared at this point of Adam and the feelings that she has for Adam. And obviously she really likes him, really cares about him, went on several days with him and thinks she could possibly develop feelings for him and is scared about what that means. Obviously, her last relationship that we that she's had, uh, we haven't really been told that she's had a relationship before uh, since Sam. So my guess is that she had Sam, and now she's here with Adam, and so her last encounter with a relationship did not end in the best way. Again, we don't really know if she's had something uh, mixed in between there, so uh, without that details, it's kind of hard to know exactly what other relationship problems she's had or hasn't had, but we can tell that she is scared and trying to avoid her feelings for Adam. Yes, his, her feelings for a werewolf might be hard because, I mean, obviously dating a werewolf in general, whether you are a coyote or not, um, is going to be hard anyway. They have a different lifestyle. It's, it's different than human, though at the same time it does have its... Uh, cons as a human and the fact that she's not human so we could see either way um, once again we see that the roommates are now making more noise again I can't even have five minutes guys five minutes the universe is once again telling me not today but let's continue going hopefully it's not too loud and you can't hear it too much um, so we do see that she does have her weak points she is scared of at least intimacy with Adam. We don't know if she would have that feelings with a human or not, whether she would have that with 
um, any other kind of paranormal. We're not sure exactly what the root of her problem is, other than the fact that Samuel really did a number on her with her last relationship that we know of, the last at least really serious one that she uh, based a lot of her ideas from. Especially as a young age, uh, we believe that, at least I believe that probably was her first real uh, relationship, and especially her being so serious about it and it being so, uh, such a big blow up in her face um, that it really has interacted and affected her up to this point. So we're going to see if she can get over those fears, if she can get past the um, hesitancy of being with Adam, we're going to find out. Uh, we also know that she has a little bit still feelings for Sam. Obviously, they never truly went away at this point. Uh, and she keeps reminding herself of all the reasons that it didn't go right. So she obviously isn't leaning towards Sam. They're more just residual feelings at this point. But she's also scared that she will have a relapse, I guess you could say, that she will go back to him and it will end up being terrible all over again as well. So we do see a little bit of vulnerability, especially at the beginning of this mixed with um, all the other kinds of problems happening around her, we do see her vulnerability when they're, especially when they're both in the room at the same time. Okay, um, and then we see that she's somebody, I feel like this is kind of a new one in this book. I feel like we didn't see it quite as much in the last book. That she's somebody who just cannot stop or slow down. I don't know if she's afraid to stop or slow down and the fact that being busy keeps her sane possibly but we see that she is just going 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 doesn't take any chances to rest for herself doesn't give her any moments of peace for herself she is just on the go on the go on the go we see that she goes right from the stuff with Stefan to being knocked out and then the second she gets up it's all business talking about it figuring out what's happening then she instantly agrees to work with the seas. Uh, and then while Stefan is dead in her closet, she can't just lay there. She instantly has to get up and go to work or get up and do something. She can't just let herself lie still and take the rest that she needs. She gets up, goes to work against everybody else saying you should just relax. Yes, I do agree that part of it could be you know, having a dead guy in your closet, but she could have gone and slept in Sam's room. She could have gone across the street and slept over at Adam's house. Again, that causes her own problems with Sam, uh, Adam and the fact that uh, she's trying to avoid him, but she could even just sleep in Jesse's room. I mean, I'm sure Jesse would allow her to do so, but instead she decides to go to work and to be proactive and to be busy. And then she goes right from work to the vampires and helps out Stefan with the meeting. So it's no stop, no rest. She just goes, 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 goes. We're going to see if that hinders her, if that helps her. I don't know at this point. Uh, I'm sure you guys don't know at this point either exactly how that's going to progress and how that's going to affect her. But she's definitely somebody who doesn't seem to be able to stop and stay, stay still. She has to keep busy, has to keep going, has to keep herself active. She can't really take the time that she needs to rest. Um, next is personal safety isn't really a concern of hers. That we've seen previously and we see it once again. Uh, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier with the previous items, but we really see that despite knowing that she's going to be in a situation that's going to put her health at risk, she just kind of jumps in there anyway and is like, let's just go. I mean, we'll just hope for the best. <laughs> and, uh, much to the chagrin of Sam and Adam and the other people who care about her and even Stefan in a way even though he's one that got her kind of into this mess felt really bad and didn't think he was actually putting her in danger so he himself does not want her to be in danger but she doesn't seem to really care about it for her own safety and last but not least we really see that she's a caring person we saw this previously and we see it again now she really truly cares about the people around her and so she puts herself in these dangerous situations for them uh, for example with Stefan even though technically he's supposed to be considered evil we see that she puts herself in danger again twice not only the first time which she was unaware of but then the second time when she knows walking into the sea and doing this uh, trial is gonna be very hard for her, 
uh, be very against her own safety, even with Ben and Warren there. But she goes in because she doesn't want Stefan to be killed outright. She wants to give him a chance to survive. So she goes and does it anyway. And we saw that previously in the last story and the fact that she was helping out Adam and Jesse and was doing everything nonstop, even things that made her uncomfortable or put her in dangerous situations in order to help the people that she cares about. So she's very, very caring, uh, takes on somebody she doesn't have to take on in order to help them pay back their bills uh, at the um, garage. Same thing that she did with Mac. She knew paying under the table was going to possibly get her in trouble, but she let Mac help out anyway because she wanted to help, uh, help him out. So she's a very, very caring person. All right, and last but not least, we always have our nitty gritty. Um, I have three things for our nitty gritty today. Uh, the first one is that Mercy can see ghosts, which I think is very interesting. We, I'm pretty sure we didn't have any mention of that in the last book. I feel like I would have mentioned it at another class if we had. But this is the first time we really see that she's interacting with somebody who then she tells us is dead. So obviously the ghost is wandering around still doing stuff and talking to her back. Um, it didn't really surprise her, so I don't know how long she's known that she can see ghosts or how long uh, she has interacted with them, but it is interesting to see that she can see ghosts. I don't know much about, you know, the other, we haven't been mentioned in much of the other paranormal as being able to see ghosts, so we're gonna have to see if that becomes something in the future or not. We'll just have to see, but it is important to keep in mind. Uh, second is we still have that power play between Sam and Adam going at the beginning of this book. They both still see Mercy as theirs, <laughs> much to uh, Mercy's chagrin and the fact that she's like, uh, I'm nobody's, <laughs> excuse you. Um, but both of them have that dominance play of both of them feeling like she's theirs. And um, so neither of them are very happy when they get close to her versus the other getting close to her. So we're gonna see as we continue going, how that works out, who she's gonna pick if she picks either of them. Uh, again, we know that she has been developing feelings for Adam, but she's scared of them. So we're gonna see how that continues for her. And we're gonna have to see if she does keep moving toward Adam, how Sam is going to take that and how he's going to be able to deal with that. Or maybe she'll go back to Sam and we'll see how Adam deals with that. We'll just have to find out. Um, and then the third thing is that Sam hasn't moved out yet, which is very interesting. He does make the comment about, you know, needing to be around wolves and not wanting to kill Adam by moving in with Adam. But him living with Mercy, though, does give him someone to live with, doesn't really, you know, have him interacting directly to other wolves per se on a daily basis. So he could move in with other humans and still not be alone. So really, what is his motivation of staying at Mercy's? And Mercy, of course, as it seems, is too nice to kick him out. <laughs> um, so we're just gonna have to see where that goes and how that also changes the dynamics, especially between her and Adam and Sam and Adam and how that also affects his interaction with Adam's pack, since he's technically more dominant than Adam, and he's technically part of the uh, Brand's pack. Still, he's still really a member of Brand's pack since he's his son. How that will affect relationships moving forward in this book. All right, and that is the end of everything for today. I uh, hope you are enjoying, again, the start of our book two for Mercy Thompson series and that you are enjoying the story and enjoying the characters just as much as I love them. Uh, if there's anything at all that you wish to discuss, debate, any questions, comments, concerns, any time I wasn't clear, anything at all, at all, please comment down below or you're also welcome to check out and comment at my Twitter uh, at Fantasy Fiction One. I would love to have a discussion with you either way, whether it's on here or it's on Twitter. If there's any um, 
suggestions for any character analysis or any writing uh, videos or classes you'd like me to do, go ahead and let me know that as well. Sorry I haven't been putting those out as much lately, I've just been mostly doing the book ones, but I do have in the works a couple of those to be come out soon. It's just hard when I don't have as much time as I thought I would in order to prep my videos uh, and classes and also film them and get them out for you. I was hoping to be able to get two out a week as I was doing when I first started. It still hasn't really gotten to the point where I can do that yet, but I'm trying, trying my best. So please stick with me and those videos will also be coming out soon as well. All right, so for our next uh, class with Bloodbound, go ahead and read chapters 5 through 8, which on my Kindle version is pages 92 through 108. So it will be the next four chapters, and I will see you then. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I will see you for our next class. <laughs> see ya!